I don't know how you are processing this loss of sleep that you experienced this morning, but I would like to encourage you to look at it in a positive light. Uh, and so here is, uh, here's the good news. The good news is we get more sunshine from here on out through the rest of the year. Isn't that good news? The good news is of all the days it could have fallen on, and I don't know that they planned it this way, but your kiddos have an entire week now to get back on their circadian rhythms. Is that the right way? To, but sleep schedule, right? So they're not, because you don't, I'm not sure the rest of us don't ever get grumpy when we lose an hour of sleep. But these are positive things that we can look at as it gets a little bit later in the day and um, we experience some more tiredness. Listen, I, today as we dig into the Word, I want to... Um, well, I want to I want to let you know this is kind of this is the last sermon in this series that we've been digging into this restore series, and really, if you haven't picked up on the theme and concept that's there, we've really been looking at and hammering at fundamentals. We've been hammering at foundations. We've I've been really forcing all of us to look back, uh, not at a single scripture, but a variety of different passages that hone in on some places that we tend to be out of balance, out of kilter. And as we've looked at those, we started off this series looking uh, Valentine's Day of all days, looking at the restoration of relationship. And we talked about love. We didn't do love versus hate, but the reality is we did talk about what happens when hate leads uh, in relationship. It doesn't work. And so we determined that God has called us uh, to be about love, that unconditional love is the first place to that. We then talked about how wretched we are in our sinfulness, but that through Christ we can be his workmanship. And it's not just that we are wretched and worthless, but because we're not, we have inherent earth, inherent worth. Um, with him as our creator, but then as a believer in Jesus Christ, the scriptures say that we are through Christ his workmanship, and he's got works that he's planned in advance for us to be about. We looked at the, 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 the balance between the divine sovereignty of God, but the significance of the personal, really the daily personal surrender of self, moment by moment, to the lordship of Christ, to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to the leadership of spirit versus flesh and just carnal desire. And so we, it, we, we followed along that. Last week we looked at the, some of the differences between thoughts and feelings and that, that, that it, our thoughts tend to drive our feelings and therefore our thoughts should be constructed around a biblical worldview. And really, I don't know that I said it this way, but the further from the Word of God that we get, the more of a problem we're going to have with feelings that don't fit the construct that God designed us and wired us for because we're not looking at life through the lens that he's provided. We also looked and noticed that feelings are a great signal at times that something is awry on the inside with the way that we are processing things. Finally, today we're going to look at grace and truth. And as I looked at a lot of these two concepts this week, knowing that it takes not one or the other, but both in tandem, both in balance, as we look at uh, not just our lives, but as we look at God's word and we look at how life should be, I came to the conclusion that I could do nothing better than to present to you the person of Jesus Christ. You say, what? Well, the Bible says in the Gospel of John that God sent his son Jesus Christ and he was made flesh and that he, was, that he dwelt among us. And the Bible describes him as being the perfect picture of grace and truth. In fact, twice in just a short number of verses, he uses those two words, grace and truth. Grace and truth. And we oftentimes feel like we can have the one without the other. I looked through a number of verses in the Bible that are gospel-centered verses this week, and many of them have a truth about man's sinfulness, but then a picture of God's payment God's gift to us in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, so there, there really is no gospel story without truth and grace. Truth is used in a variety of different ways in the Bible, I'll tell you that. I didn't get through all the commentary that was on the variety the, 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 and, the, and really the nuances of that word. It's part of what drove me back to the most simple version of that that we could look at, which is the truth of the gospel. Gospel and truth are used synonymously on a number of occasions in Scripture. I pray that I get back to this verse, but in case I don't, it is also true that that third part of the Trinity, 
The person of God that we describe as the Holy Spirit has been given the name as well in Scripture as Spirit of Truth. And so as we look at these critical pieces to what we believe about life and salvation, what we believe about how we do the faith-based life, I want us to look right back at the person of Jesus Christ and what his heart is, what his life reflected, what the Word of God tells us about who he was. In John, the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, man, you could, it, there's no part of Scripture that you don't really need, want, to, want or need or could read more of, but the Gospel of John, if you were, and, and I'll say this because I, I, I know that we have a whole host of folks that are not that experienced with the Bible, uh, maybe have never read the Bible, the Gospel of John is a great place to start. If you're looking at the Bible for the first time, you'll find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Those are letters that John wrote. But the Gospel of John is found right at the beginning of the a New Testament with the other, four, uh, well, the other three Gospels that we find there that describe the life and the works and the, re- the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in light of that, the Gospel of John was written to a group of people that really didn't have a faith background. Heathens like us. That's not an offense to you. That's really a statement about our culture. And so it's a great place to go to, to see what does the Bible say about who Jesus was. And so it begins uh, by identifying Jesus Christ as having been in heaven and in eternity, but being made flesh in this thing we call time with a purpose of our salvation. But it begins, in, if I begin in verse 14, I'm just going to read 14 through uh, I believe verse 18 is what I've got. Uh, It says, And the Word became flesh, that is, Jesus became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him. This is John the Baptist. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. It's, talk, it's going to blow your mind, but it talks, it's, it's really talking about the eternal nature of Jesus himself. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So the picture that you have in front of you is a picture that God sought and chose to give to us through his word, telling us about himself, telling us about him son, his son. And what he said was, until the coming of Jesus Christ, you didn't have a, a clear picture of who God was. Moses sought to see God and was not able to, uh, to, to cast his eyes upon him because of the holiness of God. And as the, in light of that, we find that in the person of Jesus, When he came in his humanity, it gave us the opportunity to see, finally, a physical manifestation, a picture, a picture in attitude, a picture in reality of who Jesus Christ was. Now, I'm not talking about the painting that's on the wall that in some of the classrooms that some of you grew up with. You know what I'm talking about, right? Blue-eyed Jesus, blonde-headed Jesus. Uh, we, he had to almost, uh, we know that he had olive skin. We know he would have had brown eyes. We know he would have had darker hair because he came from a region where all the people there, that is the genetic makeup. However, we don't have a literal picture of the Jesus. Although you need to know that Jesus is, there's nobody d- that debates in m- the modern era, the scientific um, existence of Jesus Christ as a life that was lived In history, like in antiquity, they're not debating that these days. There's still probably some debate by some circles as to whether or not the tomb was empty or they stole the body or X, Y, and Z. The scriptures give a clear picture that the the, the tomb was empty because Jesus rose from the grave. But there is no debate whether Jesus lived. Jesus is described in scripture as being the image of, of God himself. And so if we want to know what attitude that we should have, if we want to know how we should live life, If we want to know what is right and what is wrong, if we want to know what God believes about many things, if Jesus has spoken about it, that is the place to go. If Jesus has shared his heart on it, if he has told us that some things are more important than other things, that clarifies a lot of things for us. Does it not? Can somebody say yes? Amen. Hallelujah. Bet. Something. Tell me something. (laughs) I'm too old for that, I know. So, 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 so the... 
the reality is that I could make up some crazy stuff to try to convey to you the purest picture that I could possibly give you of the balance, the balance between truth and grace. But the fact of the matter is, God has already given us that picture in Jesus, and for me to add to or take away from that would be a mistake. And so I come to you on the authority of the word, and I, I give you this, this picture that God has given us of truth. And as we look at his life, and we, we look at what the imagery um, would, would be for us, it first causes me, a few years ago, I did, a, I did a whole series on the heart, becoming more like Jesus, like Let's take on Jesus' heart. It was a Wednesday night thing, and it lasted forever. Those of you that remember it, remember it. But it was all through the gospel, and we just literally were looking at page after page after page of what Jesus said about this. And there's this narrative that he gives about this was important, and then he talked about the Pharisees, and then there's a the woman uh, that was caught in adultery, and then there's the Samaritan woman. Well, I mean, not necessarily all in that order, but there's all these pictures that give us this image of what mattered to Jesus and what didn't matter to Jesus. You heard some flavor of that last week as we talked so much about Jesus consistently, who was the person of God having to shave off all this stuff that had been added to what he originally intended. And still today, I really want you more than to think about where is my world, because this is where I want us to keep making the gospel personal, rather than, than, than saying, where is my world out of connection with what's being described from the Scripture so that I can point with almost a, an angry, judgmental attitude about what they have wrong, I'm, I'm asking, I'm begging you to allow me to put Jesus' heart in front of you and then allow you to reflect on your own heart and say, Lord, where am I out of kilter or out of balance relative to your truth and relative to your grace? See, what I want you to see is that whether we like it or not, our experiences shape who we are. They do. If you have a parent that has been a godlike existence in your life, then discipline from a father is not hard to look at and know that it comes from a place of love. But if you either didn't have that parent parental role or that parental role was abusive in some way, you're in a really sincere way going to struggle to put that page of life together in a way that reflects his heart. And so it makes it more almost important for you to hone in on allowing God's Holy Spirit to be and shape you in a way that reflects him more clearly. In the same way, those that... Uh, maybe come from a, a very rigid background where everything has a shape and a box and we know where all of it fits, it's going to be natural to want to put everything in a legalistic, moralistic category. And, I, and don't get me wrong, I am, there's some things that, are, as I've already said, are ultra clear that related to ethics and related to, to morality, but those come out of a balanced place where forgiveness is provided and then it drives us to want us to be more like Christ. And so it drives how we view about that. But, but where does the grace piece fit in? Some of you have a compassionate mentality. You're wired that way. Praise God that you are. Grace comes easy. Discipline comes very difficult. I mean, it does. You're going you're to struggle with that. If, if you are... And I'm giving, this is maybe, maybe an off-the-cuff example is not a good one, but in, in the years of ministry that I've had, I have, I have inter encountered and inter interacted with many, many people that walk in off the street. Maybe not in some of the environments and probably don't have some of the stories to tell that you do. Um, probably the scariest one for me was the fellow that had just gotten out of prison and still had all the tags on his uh, wrist from the, the, the hospital that he had been at as a part of all that, and he showed up, and I was by myself, and it was dark, and he wanted money, and I knew that I didn't need to give him money, but I didn't know how to get him out of where I was, and it, just, it, was, it was crazy. What I do know is that when those same folks show up on a Sunday morning, it's exceedingly difficult because the ones that are bitten with the, the grace bug, and it's a good bug. Everybody needs to have some people like that in their house. They need to have people like that in their family. They need to have people like that at the leadership table and in their class. Because if not, we become hard and we become harsh. I've got a little bit of that in me. I do. Um, but it's been kind of hardened over the years in a way. Because, but but if, if you have to make a yes or no answer relative to whatever the story is and the situation placed before you, no is never an option, it seems, 
if the compassionate people are in the room. There's never a time that, you, that you're going to look and say, I'm pretty sure Jesus would have said no right here. But let me, be, let me be confidently honest with you. There are some times that you are an enabler and not a helper. That what God the Father would do and even the Son Jesus Christ, he would say, look, you are wasting that and you've wasted it before. You're not telling me the truth right now. And so, no. The answer is no, no, no. But if, you're a bit, if, if you come from a, you're, you're going to struggle to be able to say, to, to sharp, because you, you're naturally bent in a different direction. Experiences are a piece of it. Some of you, though, have had so many people take advantage of you through the years, and you've got a natural business mentality. Ain't all bad. You worked for it. You earned it. And so, yes doesn't come easy, right? They're in the hospital. You're like, I'll see you when, I, when you get out. You're going to go by and take some food before they go because they may have trouble sleep. See, I'm that guy. I'm like, you know, they may have trouble sleeping the night before. If I get a chance, I'm going to give them a call, and we're going to pray, and we're going to talk about it. Some of you are like, who's got time for all that, man? Just let me know which days I need to fill in their class, and, and just let me know when they get back. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? None of us, thank you, none of us were, were, uh, were, were, were gifted with everything that Jesus Christ reflected we are better together than separate. And so all of us together make up a more balanced approach if done right. What I'm really trying to tell you, though, is that even through different eras of history, churches and individual groupings of believers in particular cities at particular times have gone from one direction to the other. I mean, don't you think if we were looking at the Crusades, we'd decide there probably was a little bit too little compassion and grace in that mix as they were allowing them at knife point to choose or reject the gospel? I mean, it may have been more than a truth and, and gospel issue going on, but and don't you think that there are other times when sinfulness is not looked at with a serious kind of note as to believe that Jesus' death on the cross was the payment required for those activities? You, you, you kind of get where I'm going? I hope you do. And so we have to find and acknowledge that in our own life there may be places where we need to rub up against the gospel of Jesus Christ and continue to rub up against the word. Not just as we hear what others say about it, but as we read and allow the Holy Spirit of God to refine us. To soften us in some places and maybe to harden us in some others. But my prayer is that you would be tender as we continue also to look at these concepts, we find a couple of images. Um, I tell you what, I want to give you. I want to give you the. I, I told you I'm giving you the picture of Jesus Christ, and He was that picture of grace and truth, right? Because He came and spoke uh, vehemently towards those that lacked grace, which would have been the hypocrites and the Pharisees, and he also had a tender heart towards the sinners, the heathen, the tax collectors. I'm, he, he was friends with them, but he never overlooked any of that. Like, there was always this balance, but they knew where he stood. They knew his heart. I want to give you two images that I hope that you can take with you. Some of you that are from Florida, and if you're not, some of you are new to town. Some of you may be watching online from other places and you may need to be introduced to Florida. One for one, this is a beautiful time of year uh, in our community. Uh, but when you go to the beach, not everything is something you want to touch. How many of you are familiar with the term prickly pear? You know what a prickly pear is? Sand spurs are in this category. I'm not going into sand spurs, but you don't want a foot full of them. But a prickly pear is not a gentle thing. Have you all seen one of those? You can find, well, then you need to go to the San Andrews State Park because in the San Andrews State Park, they have these in and around the dunes. You don't want to just pull those flip-flops off and go marching through like, I'm at the beach, I'm going to be all barefoot. Well, there's some parts of Northwest Florida you don't want to be barefoot. I mean, you're throwing the football and all of a sudden that thing goes into a palmetto thicket that's got some of those in it and, oh, it is not feel good. I mean, they, they, may, they may have a pretty yellow bloom at times, but you don't want any of that. You say, why are you showing me that? 
Because some of us, if we're not careful, we are gospel prickly pears. That's what we are. A gospel prickly pear. Why do you define that? Well, I put a definition on it. I made it up first. A person that has accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ but is lacking grace. They're so full of truth, they just can't seem to apply to their own life and to the life of others what Christ has applied to theirs. You know what happens when you get too close, close to a prickly pear? They poke you. I mean, you keep trying to get close to them, and every time you get close, they just start throwing daggers, and you're like, finally, like, okay, I'm going to give them space. Can I show you what it looks like when you have a whole bunch of prickly pears? That's a church nobody wants to go to. <laughs> That's the First Baptist Church of Gospel Truth right there, minus grace. And nobody wants that. I mean, that's that legalistic place that has not figured out that sometimes we add to what God has, has told us we ought to be about. Do you hear what I'm saying? But on the other side to that, I made up another one. You're not going to like this one as good probably, but I'm, I like it, so I'm giving it to you. The gospel spring breaker. Who is that? You can be a spring breaker and it not be bad, but those of us that have been around Bay County for a little while, we know there's a version of that that we don't want nothing to do with. And those are these. They're a person that's accepted the gospel of Christ, but is unfazed by the biblical demands for personal holiness. Like They're like, I got grace. I'm good to go, man. I'm, I'm, I'm free for the week. You know, I left God up in Michigan, and I'm down here, and I'm good to go. Well, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I met a few of these and have had some personal interactions with some of these. You've not lived until you have sought to share the gospel with a well-built young man that had had a little too much to drink on the sidewalk at La Vila. <laughs> yes, sir, I was there. Some of y'all hadn't heard this part of my story. We were there the first time I ever went to La Vila. Is that a strange way to start a sentence for a pastor? <laughs> first time I ever went to La Vila, I stood on the sidewalk with cold bottles of water trying to provide a peaceful presence so that nobody got taken advantage of and share the gospel. By year number two, some of y'all know this, we go down there and do that. The mo this is probably the best of, of what I could tell you, but this fellow had R Romans 6.23 across his heart. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All he had was Romans 6.23. I don't think he knew most people expected me maybe to know what that was. And he doesn't remember the conversation. probably doesn't even remember me. But I asked him a question. I said, hey, you got that tattoo inked up, man. You're like probably 21. That's a lot of pain to go through if it didn't mean something to you. What does it mean? Tell me what that means to you. He went right on through the gospel, and I'm, and, I, and I'm like trying to throw, I didn't, it didn't work, but I wanted to throw up a red flag and say, hey, you're a gospel spring breaker, brother. You got the grace part down, but can we talk about truth just for a second? Like, can we take the scripture and just read it? I mean, I'm not trying to be dogmatic about other people, but, but like literally, this is where we sometimes find ourselves, is we want all the benefits of grace, but we don't want to bother with the other part that we know's there, but we deny and I'm just going to tell you, it won't work in your family. It won't work in your heart spiritually. As a, just like an individual believer, it doesn't work in the church. When we get it out of kilter, it's out of kilter. And so as we're trying to have a foundation spiritually, we've got to, to choose to give God's spirit and his word in particular the freedom to allow us to, to avoid either of those flawed views of God and his word. He does not want us to be a gospel prickly pear, Right? And he does not want us to be a gospel spring breaker. He wants us to be the balance and the picture of grace and truth that he was. Through the ebb and flow of life, I have fallen off both sides of, of that. There have been times that probably things that God felt really, really strongly about, I didn't, it, it took a while maybe. And I, I'm still, I don't, I don't get everything right all the time, right? And there's probably some times that I felt stronger about some things than God himself did. Interesting to actually hear that out loud and begin to process that relative to the word of God. I also, again, want to make note that Romans 6, 23 has the truth. The wages of sin is death. That's truth. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's grace. So many of these verses that we look at that talk to us about the significance of Jesus, they have both. 
As we accept his grace, we are able to accept his grace because we've acknowledged his truth. And the good news of Jesus Christ is absolutely, the true gospel is absolutely grace and truth. But Jesus came bringing both. You know, he also wants us to be authentic and sincere. That is a highly valued quality in our culture today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. As much as we as a modern culture desire to be a place of sincerity in how we practice all of life, to be a believer in Jesus Christ, to be a confessed, like I acknowledge that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, doesn't mean you're perfect, but it does mean that if I'm going to be authentic, then I'm going to personally surrender what I understand and know of me to the Lord. And it means in the places that, 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 there are, that I know there's parts of my life that are not surrendered to him, then I, what, what's, the, what's the plausible likely response? Surrender those areas to him. Bring those areas in line with his word. Some of you are like, well, I don't know what the word says. We need to read it. I mean, literally, you don't need to take somebody else's word for it. You don't need to take the modern era's word for it or the old era's word for it. You need to go back to the scripture itself. What does it say about X, Y, or Z? You know, X, Y, and Z aren't in there. Those are like math terms, you know, but... What does it say about lying? What does it say about worship? What does it say about what my daily life should be like with the Lord Christ? There was a whole church in Revelation 2 that was guilty of not, uh, the, third, the church at Thyatira was guilty of getting a lot of things right, but not, not being worried at all about physical sins that were taking place in the church. And so, the Lord God called them out. He gave them a truth talk. Have you ever noticed that you really value, I hope you do, you, don't you value, you may not in a in given moment, but if you have people in your life that you know love you, like you truly know they love you, if they're speaking to you out of love, doesn't it help you process like that they want you to be better? They're telling you because they don't want you to be harmed. I mean, I just want you to know, and I think it's, I think it's what, what it means to be human. I receive constructive criticism so much better when I don't believe that the person giving it to me has a personal gain or a personal prefer preference to be gained by giving me that encouragement to change whatever. Right? I mean, it's, the person, it, it, it's true in all of our life. And it doesn't mean that if you do that you shouldn't, but I'm telling you that very few people... I don't think many people have people in their life that they trust that much. I think it is a guarded thing for parents and children to have a relationship where they know, even when they're not happy they, about the decision, they know their parents love them, and that's the reason why. Like, that's why the directive's coming. I want you to, that's, that's how God interacts with us. Few people in our world have had parents to serve in that role in that way we live in a world that's predominantly something different than two parents that love unconditionally one another and their children like that's not normal that's so you don't need to think that you're not normal anymore because you probably are normal if you didn't come from a two-parent home it should be that way but it's not that way we're living in a world literally that is not generally reflective of the teachings of christ so in order to know what that is we have to actually go back and look and read you say, huh. And I would hope that in your own life, if you haven't before, you could begin to take stock in what value there is in having truth tellers in your life. But isn't it also nice to have some grace givers in your life? Yeah, thank you. It's rhetorical, but it, 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 it's, good. it's worth answering. Yeah. It's good to have them. Uh, there are times that we are going to determine that we read the scriptures and, and we are confident it says 
X, but then we're still not at peace about whatever the thing is. If I, I think the example that I've used before is that, you know, you, you could have a peace about going to a place and being at, a, at an event, or maybe you feel like the scriptures don't say you can't, but then you don't feel like you have peace to go do that. Well, what you need to do is not go. The Bible says if you can't do it by faith, then, then it's sin. But this is the important one to hear me say. Really catch this one. This idea of thoughts and feelings. Our worldview should be shaped by the word so that when, that, when we do not think that we feel like something is not sinful, but the Bible says that it is. The Holy Spirit didn't tell you it wasn't. You, 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 the, the Bible's never wrong. Your understanding of the Holy Spirit is sometimes. You kind of get in the pictures. The idea that God's word's authoritative, we are not. And so we use God's word as a, a filter. But Jesus also, with a group of people that were using his word as a filter, well, you pull up in, in, in Matthew chapter 23, and, and I, I've read different parts of this at different times, but I, I feel compelled to just talk about it again because so oftentimes we, man, I found myself being challenged about what I value versus what he values. And this has changed over time. I mean, for me, it has. And you've witnessed it and seen it, and we're still kind of in the middle of it to some extent. But, but literally what he says to them, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites. I just feel like I call y'all that a lot. I don't mean it that way, like personally. But he says, you tithe on the mint, the dill, and the cumin, and have neglected the weight of your matters. So Jesus is saying to them, you guys actually measure out the amount of herbs you use in your garden, the mint and the cumin, and you make sure to even go so far as to tithe off each of those. But there's some other stuff that matters more that you haven't gotten right. You've got this truth part right, but the grace part's missing. He goes on and says this. Like, remember, he, he, he had, this is, it's his picture, he, it, his heart. The weight of your matters of the law, that is justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. They all mattered, but you should have done the weight of your stuff too. He says, you blind guides. You're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So they would, you know, camel's a big animal. And then, and, and then the gnats, they had gnats, and I guess they had to strain them out of cooking stuff. I, I actually had my own imagery here. It, it's not exact because it's not about straining it out so we don't eat it. But we are in northwest Florida. I'm sorry I keep going back to, like, who we are. But if you're not used to Florida yet, just wait till like, June, July. You know, the yellow flies come first, but then it's the gnats. And so I, 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 the meaning is the same, but I wanted to give you a modern translate. Can I do this? You blind guides that are swatting gnats and swallowing llamas. That might not be funny. You might not get it. But we're spending time swatting at things, straining out. We've got to get this just perfect. Meanwhile, here comes the camel. Meanwhile, it's, 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 it's the same text where there's the you're dealing with the speck in the other guy's eye, and you got the log hanging out your own. See, this is that place where individually we're looking into our own life and saying, God, show me where I am failing in this balance of grace and truth. Because we live in an ultra polarized time where everybody seems to be ultra confident in their own perspective that it's okay and ultra confident that the other person's actions are wrong. And it doesn't mean that you're wrong, but it does mean there needs to be this balance of grace and truth and whatever it is you think should be based on God's word. You hearing me? We don't want to be a church full of <coughs> prickly pears. Nor do we want to be a church that's full of gospel spring breakers. I feel like I could name preachers that fall on both sides. I'm not going to do it. I actually had a couple of names that came to mind and I decided to refrain from it. 
I think that was the Holy Spirit, don't y'all? <laughs> and you don't need, please don't call any out. Just don't, don't do that. I, I think it'd be wrong for you to do that too. And I think the, ten, the potential is there for any church to fall away from God's word and allowing that to be the foundation and falling off one side or the other. It's not either or. It's both, but the standard is the heart of God and the person of Jesus Christ. And we need to make extra careful that when we speak truth, we do what Ephesians 4 and verse 15 says, and we speak truth in love. When it comes from a place of love, it's a different place, and the place of love is not where a lot of what we have unfortunately shared tends to come from. So I thought, as I close this down, I, I, I had this thought, like, what, do you, what are you supposed to do with, with what I just gave you? You're like, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get in my boat and go to the, sh the island this afternoon. That's what I'm going to do with it. I'm not saying you're a sinful person. I'm looking right into the camera. Some of you are sitting right there on the island right this minute. <laughs> I'm not saying I covet your position. Um, but I'm a little jealous. Here, here's, here's the truth. We need to seek God and say, God, break me down where I am proud and arrogant in my views of what you think about somebody else and have not even looked closely at my own musings about things that are not even as weighty or significant. Like, their stuff doesn't even matter, and here I am with all my mess pinging on. Lord, show me where I need to begin to be more grace-filled, more like Jesus. And then I also want to challenge you that you should ask the Lord, where would you have my conversation? Where would you have my thoughts? What do I need to do in my study so that my compass is sufficiently sharpened not to be able to judge somebody else, but to be able to evaluate my own life as to the attitudes that don't reflect your heart so that I don't fall off on either side, not grace or truth, but I have both come in. See, the fact of the matter is grace was provided at the ultimate cost by Jesus Christ. And the expectation is that at that cost, we would live life to honor him. It's gospel. If you've never chosen Christ, I'd love to be able to introduce you to the Lord Jesus. If I've never had a chance to meet you and you want to talk for a minute, I, I, I think I've missed that opportunity with some folks along the way. I'll be down here at the front immediately after it's over. There'll be a table out front out at the, in, the, in the foyer on the 390 side where people would be happy to talk to you about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, we're going to sing a song called Build My Life in this whole contemplation and reflection should be Lord what would you do with my life how would you have me shape that and be different this coming week what is it that you've brought to mind where am I not where you'd have me be stand together with me if you would and I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer Father I thank you for freedom to be able to just present your word. Lord, you have, there's, there's parts of this that we will never be able to under, or, or articulate or understand in our humanity. The notion that Jesus himself is eternal, has been and is moving forward, but that he stepped out of eternity in the form of man and gave us the perfect picture of grace and truth. Lord, literally a picture of your glory, a picture of who you want us to be. But as he presented to us himself, he also presented himself to us as sacrifice so that we, through your spirit, can live in a way that honors you. Lord, I pray that we come to grips with our own sin first so that we can repent and receive forgiveness and salvation. But then, Lord, I pray that your spirit of truth would be given freedom in our life to convict us where our life 
does not reflect your heart. It doesn't reflect your attitude. And Lord, it is not a simple thing to live life in the United States in 2021 in a way that reflects the heart of Jesus Christ. And so I pray we would be intentional. I pray that you would mold families around this concept of doing life according to the word. I pray that where our experiences and our backgrounds have been either positive or negative that have shaped us, that we would keep the places that reflect the heart of Jesus Christ and how you operate and deal with us. But Lord, I also pray that you would heal some wounds that keep us from being able to see you and see your truth as it is. Take the stresses, the struggles, the storms that we are going through and use them to make us better reflect your love. And Father, I pray that we could be that person in the lives of others where without desire for gain in our own life, but out of love, we can encourage, we can spur, we can nudge one another unto love and good works. Lord, I love this body of believers that you've given me the opportunity to speak with and to, and I pray that this week you would help us to better reflect all of who you are in truth and in grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.